I had the Korean War, which is also known as the Forgotten War, because many people don't remember it. It's not really a big thing that they think that happened. So this little video explaining the origin. The end of the Second World War meant peace and prosperity for Americans and many other people around the world. Yet for the Koreans, it represented difficulty. Korea was part of the Japanese Empire throughout the first half of the 20th century. When Japan fell during the Second World War, Korea was suddenly free and hoped to finally be able to decide the fate of their own country. Most Koreans campaigned for a unified state. However, the United States and the Soviet Union had different ideas. The Soviets wanted to expand the sphere of communist influence into Korea. The United States countered by encouraging the establishment of democracy. Additionally, the United States stressed the importance of containment, which is a foreign policy used to prevent the spread of communism. This disagreement would eventually lead to the Korean War. The Korean War was the first battle of the Cold War and first major proxy war fought between the United States and a Soviet communist-supported enemy. A proxy war occurs when one or more opposing powers instigates a war and then uses third parties to fight on their behalf. Other examples of proxy wars include the Vietnam War and the war in Afghanistan. At the Potsdam Conference in 1945, the Allies decided to split Korea into two parts of the 38th parallel. North Korea became a Soviet-supported communist regime under the leadership of Kim Il-sung. South Korea became a U.S.-supported democratic state under Sigmund Rhee. After the vision of Korea, Kim Il-sung looked to unify the nation. He garnered support from the Soviet Union and China to launch an invasion in South Korea and remove those who supported Sigmund Rhee's appearance of democracy. Armed with Soviet rifles and tanks, North Korea crossed the 38th parallel on June 25, 1950. The war was underway. President Harry Truman viewed the situation as more than just a war between two nations. He feared the North Korean strike was the first step in an international communist takeover led by the Soviet Union. In response, Truman cited a 1950 national security report known as NSC-68, which called for military force to contain communism. The president and other top officials saw the conflict as an opportunity to declare war against communism. Therefore, with support from the United Nations, the United States moved to establish peace and remove the communist invaders from South Korea. So that kind of just explains how it all started, why it all started. <clears throat> So here are the leaders of the three main countries that were in the Korean War. Harry Truman, who was the President of the United States, he believed that the invasion, from South Korea, the invasion of South Korea was a challenge from the Soviets, and if he left that alone, he believed it would start another world war, and he did not want that to happen, and he also believed it would be a step towards further communist violence. He called for the assistance from the United Nations, which is the international intergovernmental organization that promotes international cooperation for a little extra help, and that included 20 plus countries. Or sorry, that included countries like Australia, New Zealand, and um, some others like that. And he wanted to use a containment strategy, which was like it was in the video. It was kind of like little bars, which was to keep communism in the north and not let it see seep down into the South. Sigmund Rhee was the president, the first president actually of South Korea. Kim Il-sung was the president of North Korea and he was also the leader of Democratic People's Republic of Korea, which was founded in 1948 by him. And in the summer of 1950, he led the invasion into the South to try and overtake all of Korea and have it under communist control. So some of the major figures of the war. Douglas MacArthur, he was the general at first of everyone, so he oversaw all the actions that took place. He was put in control of the UN forces and wanted to drive back the North Korean soldiers. He failed to anticipate attacks from the Chinese forces up north who were trying to help the Soviet Union in North Korea overtake South Korea. Um, he was forced, him and his troops were forced to retreat. He wanted to include China as a part of the war due to his defeat in this of pushing back the North Koreans that didn't work. But Truman disagreed and they continued to have this disagreement the whole entire time until 
When he kept refusing Truman's ideas, Truman fired him in April 1951, and he returned back to the United States, but he was seen as a hero to everyone in the U.S., except he, except Truman still openly criticized him about his actions. General Walton Walker, July 29, 1950, this is a really big thing that happened, that he is known for, the standard die order, and this is what he said, we are fighting a battle against time, there will be no more retreating, withdrawal, or re readjustment of the lines, or any other term you choose. There is no line behind us to which we can retreat. There will be no Dunkirk, there will be no Bataan. A retreat to Busan would be one of the greatest butcheries in history. We must fight until the end. We will fight as a team. If some of us must die, we will die fighting together. I want everybody to understand we are going to hold this line. We are going to win. In this order, is what led to the victory of the Pusan perimeter, which was a big victory in a step of moving the North Koreans back up north. Um, sadly, he was killed on December 23, 1950, in a military-connected traffic accident in South Korea during the war. Oliver P. Smith, he was the commanding general of the 1st Marine Division. On November 1950, him and his Marine Division were surrounded by the communists. And all he and he immediately thought that they had to retreat and go back. So he directed a 70-mile breakout to the seaport of Hongnam. This careful march north and ability to keep division together saved his whole Marine division and many more from total destruction. Matthew B. Ridgeway, he was a deputy chief of staff. He replaced General Walker after his death as commander of Eighth Army. Due to his aggressive leadership and being offensively minded, the 8th Army was able to retake Seoul, which because the 8th Army um, before was really mostly defensive and wanted to kind of retreat back and wait, but he was offensively minded and kind of, he let go of everyone who was defensively minded and brought in new people who wanted to push forward and take that offensive step. With the removal of MacArthur, he was actually promoted to general later, so he was overseeing all the actions of the military and he was able to slowly push back the North Koreans and the Chinese, and he oversaw, oversaw restoration of, Japan, of Japan's sovereignty and independence on April 28, 1952. James Van Fleet, he took over the 8th Army for Ridgeway after Ridgeway took over for MacArthur, and he continued to strengthen the 8th Army and make them more offensively minded as well. Dwight D. Eisenhower, he said in his presidential campaign, if he was elected president, he would personally go to Korea to get an upfront and close view of the war. And he had a get tough policy towards the communists in Korea and he sent messages to them. He would, he explained to those messages that he would use any force, of, any force necessary to get the war to end, including nuclear weapons unless talk of peace began to move forward. So he wanted the war to end as soon as possible and get those people to be able to get as many of his troops out of there alive and keep more people alive there as well. And this is kind of blurry, but it's a MASH unit. Many of you might know the show MASH unit, which is kind of, it kind of explains what happens, but it's not technically correct. In that MASH unit, they had maybe a total of they had like four doctors. They didn't have that many people, but in a real mass unit, you could have up to 89 um, marine doctors, or sorry, uh, servicemen, like doctors for the army, specif specified doctors for the army. You could have, I think it was like more than 10 other doctors, and um, it was like a total of like 150 people in one mass unit. So it's a lot bigger than it actually was seen on the TV. But they were. MASH stands for the Mobile Army Surgical Hospital. And with these breakthroughs in war medicine, they were able to keep many casualties alive during the war. And they debuted in Korea, which was, so it was the first time that they were using MASH units during war. And it took them under one hour to get from the battlefield to the MASH unit, which is kind of quick for being able to go from the battlefield and then straight to the MASH unit to be able to keep those casualties alive with the distance that they had to go. And it was 
a really big step because women were working alongside men in these mass units. And on average, they could go through 300 wounded soldier, soldiers in just 24 hours. So some major events that occurred. Bloody Gulch, it was a war crime that was committed by the North Koreans on August 12, 1950. 75 to 100 U.S. Army prisoners of war were captured and executed by members of, North, of the North Korean People's Army, and 80 men were wounded in that as well. And due to this, the U.S. Air Force dropped multiple, multiple leaflets, which are a type of bomb, like a big bomb, over enemy territory to kind of get back at them. And No Name Ridge, it's a ridge that has no name, but they named it, the soldiers who were included in this named it No Name Ridge. It's a one and a half mile ridge that led directly south to Busan. And it lost, they lost to the, to the communists at first, so they wanted to regain it. And it was kind of a necessity to regain because Busan is kind of south of the country, like in the southern part of South Korea. So they didn't want the communists to come all the way down and overtake obviously the whole country. So August 17th, the U.S. For forces charged the ridge, and this is from a Time magazine reporter who witnessed the Marines' hero heroism, who wrote, hell burst around the Marines as they moved up the barren face of the ridge. Everywhere alongside the assault line, men dropped. To continue looked impossible. But all glory forever to the bravest men I ever saw. The line did not break. The casualties were unthinkable, but the assault force never turned back. And due to this determination of the U.S. forces, the Marines were able to break through and recapture No Name Ridge. And the U.N. turning to air power was a big positive for them and a big help with using airstrikes and dropping bombs. So planes were all obviously very vital to the win. Um, 1952, the U.N. air power reached peak strength. And on June 23, 1952, they attacked industri all the industrial plants, or the majority of the industrial plants in North Korea. And 90%, due to this attack, 90% of the North Korean electrical capacity was destroyed. Um, so I have a video explaining the Iron Triangle because it's kind of a big part, but it it's kind of hard to explain. It's kind of a gory video. Well, not gory, but there are pictures of dead people, and there's a limb that's kind of just laying on the ground. Yeah, the middle seat's open. They look so numb. In the spring of 1951, a Chinese buildup was in progress in the Iron Triangle, a mountainous region north of the 38th parallel. UN forces sought to conquer the triangle since it would provide a comfortable buffer zone between the enemy and Seoul. But its borders were heavily guarded and tough to crack. Far East Commander Ridgway knew the Chinese were planning a major drive from the triangle, so he assumed a conservative offensive strategy in the approaches to it. After facing the Chinese for six months, his troops knew how they operated. They would come hard and then suddenly not at all. They were vicious fighters, but only in spurts. So Ridgway drew a series of lines leading up to the Iron Triangle that would mark the stages of his planned advance. When the troops reached one line, they would use it as a jumping off point to push on to the next. If they had to fall back, the previous line would be a place to stop and show up defenses so that the retreat wouldn't pick up speed. Each line was named for an American state. The 8th Army had recently conquered the Idaho Line and was now standing along the Kansas Line a few miles above the 38th parallel. The next goal would be the Utah Line, an extension of the Kansas. Finally, the Wyoming Line lay at the base of the Iron Triangle. Whether going or coming along that grid, the UN goal was to butcher the enemy in massive numbers. In late April, UN forces were holding the Utah line and pushing hard to reach Wyoming. Then the second Chinese wave suddenly broke. 
On April 22nd, heavy attacks came against the weaker South Korean units in the center of the peninsula. The Reds again threatened to split the UN front in two, but the new phase line retreat strategy worked. The 8th Army fell back to the Kansas line and dug in deep. There they held hard and took everything the Chinese could offer. Within a week, the enemy ran low on supplies and men and suffered huge losses for an insignificant piece of land. To the American troops who had seen their adversaries run out of gas after all of their previous attacks, this was no surprise. The communists were getting predictable. Two weeks later, the Chinese tried one last major offensive, but this time, Field Commander Van Fleet had a special treat for them. He ordered an unprecedented barrage of heavy artillery. In a single 24-hour period, one battalion fired off more than 12,000 rounds, an all-time record. Teams of troops operated an assembly line of ammunition sending an endless succession of shells airborne. 35,000 Chinese were killed or wounded at a cost of only 900 UN servicemen. The bombardment is remembered today as the Van Fleet Loaded. The general's aim to expand steel, not men, had come to fruition. UN firepower was beating red manpower. In June, Van Fleet's forces made it to the Wyoming line. Their advance was moving so fast that they overran active communist bases and took thousands of prisoners and supplies as they went. But when they tried to break into the Iron Triangle itself, they collided with a steel wall of enemy resistance. It took 10 days of round-the-clock air support and artillery attacks to break into the Triangle's base. But once they cracked the foundation, the whole house collapsed. Two tank forces drove northward and took full control of the Triangle, putting the UN in their best position since the Chinese entered the war. It was an ideal field position to bring to the truce table. Total victory over the Chinese might take years and cost countless American lives. So Ridgway wired Washington to say the time to talk peace was now. President Truman and his Joint Chiefs concurred. It was time to extend the olive branch. So that's just a little bit about um, how that played a really big role in getting the peace between the two countries to come to begin, actually. On the banks of this river in Korea, in 1951, America, Britain, and their United Nations allies were locked in a battle with tech. And then the armistice, which is, a, which is a truce signing, it happened on July 27, 1953, and it said that the peninsula would be divided along the front lines, which was the 38th parallel, which is what the UN wanted, so it was technically a win for the United Nations. And kind of a milestone that occurred, um, blacks were fighting alongside whites for the first time during the war, and this picture is of UN soldiers during the war, as you can see, there's both black and white people. The impact on the U.S., it wasn't like the effects of the World Wars. Um, the 1950s were a pleasant place in America. People just went on with their lives. Like this picture, just kids riding bikes in the neighborhood. I mean, 
it wouldn't really affect kids anyway, but they still were able to just do what they wanted to do. 40% to 50% of the federal budget went to defense and military costs, and it has stayed like this ever since. It's if it hasn't gone, if it hasn't changed, like it hasn't gone down, it's only gone up from there. And it was beginning the beginning of racial integration in the U.S. military service. Gerald Early stated that the Korean War's impact on integration and racial relations in the U.S. was a driving force behind integration efforts during the early years of the Civil Rights Movement. And by the end of the war, the military had become the most integrated institution in the U.S. Impact on the world, it was actually the start of the Cold War. For North and South Korea, the population, both their populations dropped immensely due to the many deaths of their civilians and also and also servicemen and women servicemen but there are also many civilians who became refugees families were separated and some even ended up on opposite sides of the 38th parallel three months after the beginning of the war 57,000 South Koreans were declared missing and in 1954 an international child welfare agency estimated that 2 million children under the age of 18 had been displaced from their own homes and many Korean families found themselves once again on opposite sides of the 38th parallel. And they, these family members were known as separated families. And some have not gotten back to each other since then. And there were also a lot of destruction of land and houses. Three months after the beginning of the war, more than 500,000 homes had either been destroyed or damaged. For Japan, it was a really big economic boost due to the expenses from the U.S. and other U.N. Um, countries involved in the Korean War, and it totaled about $4 billion. And the current state of the Japanese economy could not have been what it is like today if the war had not occurred. In China, there was a huge population decrease there as well, and it now has an alliance with North Korea. And this picture resembles the Cold War flag between the United States and the USSR. So the Korean War, through the numbers, just to get some statistical facts down. It lasted three years. There were more than three million casualties, including servicemen and civilians who were killed, wounded, or missing. There were more than 20 countries involved. A lot of them, obviously, you had China, um, the USSR, North and South Korea, and but you also have the US, and then all the UN countries. So about 15 countries that were fighting for South Korea. Um, there were some doctors in the mass units who did up to 80 straight hours of surgery. And like in the video said, one battalion had fired off more than 12,000 rounds in 24 hours. And this picture is of a UN soldier meeting with a, a young villager. And how it is today, soldiers still patrol the 38th parallel. And those servicemen and women who served in the war are seen as the bravest and selfless in war history. And there's a war memorial in Washington, D.C., which is what that picture is of.